a series of new decisions from the Supreme Court, a major one dealing with abortion access. The justices clearing the way for Idaho hospitals to provide emergency abortions, at least for now, in a procedural ruling. But key questions are left unanswered, and the issue is expected to come up before the court again soon. Joining me now, The Hill's courts and legal reporter, Zach Schoenfeld. Zach, at first glance, this is a big win for abortion rights groups, but it does not really resolve the issues at the heart of the case, meaning the same justices who voted to overturn the right to abortion could soon again be considering whether doctors can provide abortions in medical emergencies. How are both sides of abortion access seeing this ruling? I think whether uh, both sides can agree on one thing, and that is whether they are celebrating a win today or a loss today, that this is only temporary. And that's because the Supreme Court could again take up this very same issue in a future case. It could do so by taking up this same lawsuit in Idaho again at a later juncture. It could also take up a case from another Republican-led state that has passed abortion restrictions that the Biden administration believes conflicts with these federal protections known as EMTALA. In fact, the Biden administration right now has a pending petition for the Supreme Court to take up this same issue in another case that arises out of Texas. Supreme Court isn't going to get to it by the time they go to their summer recess, but all eyes will be on this petition when they come back in October for their next term and start getting into what cases they're going to take up for their next term. So very much so, uh, this could not be the final word on this. The Supreme Court's decision, their bottom line today was, we jumped into this too early and we should have never taken this specific case. Now, the court also came out with a ruling involving the Securities and Exchange Commission and how securities fraud plays out. Now, talk about the effects of the SEC and those they oversee, plus how it might impact other regulatory agencies. Yeah, this has big impacts for the SEC and its ability to prosecute fraud. That is, seek civil fraud penalties using an in-house system before uh, its own in-house courts with its own administrative law judges. The Supreme Court majority today saying that that is unconstitutional. And these defendants have a Seventh Amendment constitutional right to go before a jury. So now the SEC is going to have to go through the normal system where they go for through a normal federal district court where there's a judge there who has been nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And then if the defendant wants, they can have a jury of their peers decide their fate. And this is important because the SEC has a much better track record of success in prosecuting these cases when they go in their own in-house system that the Supreme Court has now ruled unconstitutional. So if the SEC wants to bring these types of cases in the future, they're going to have a much more difficult time. Now, Zach, the Supreme Court is expected to miss its late June end date because of a backlog of cases right now. Talk about what else we are expecting to hear from the court. We know a big one is this presidential immunity question, correct? Yeah, that immunity case, whether former President Trump has uh, immunity for official acts while he was in the White House, that is really the headliner of what's left. But even putting that to the side, there are still a lot of major cases that are left for the Supreme Court to decide. Uh, they have two major cases relating to social media regulation. They have another big case implicating the administrative state, the scope of federal agencies' power, just like that SEC case we were talking about. That is whether the justices are now going to overrule what has been known as Chevron deference, which has given federal agencies across the government wide authority. They also have a big case related to January 6th, whether federal prosecutors were proper in bringing an obstruction charge against more than 300 different January 6th defendants. So that could possibly throw all of their prosecutions uh, up into the air. So still a lot of cases to go. As you were saying, the Supreme Court is expecting to miss its own self-imposed deadline at the end of June. We're expecting more opinions Friday morning, but the Supreme Court has also announced they expect to release opinions on Monday, July 1st. It's unclear at this point if that'll be the last day or if they'll even have to go further into July. Bottom line, decision season is getting drawn out. Now, thank you, Zach Schoenfeld. Good to be with you. It's debate night in Atlanta. Former President Trump and President Biden are set to face off in a matter of hours, the first debate of the 2024 campaign. It's the earliest debate Americans have ever seen, and there are new rules that each candidate agreed to before they square off. Both candidates are going into the debate hoping for a game-changing performance as they remain in a deadlock race for the White House. Joining us now to talk about this historic debate and more is The Hill's White House correspondent, Alex Gingitano. Alex, thanks for being on. We know that Trump and Biden are putting a lot of preparation into this primetime event, spending hours with advisors going over strategy. What's the number one goal for each candidate tonight? What are they hoping to achieve? 
That's right. A lot of preparation is going into this debate. I think, first of all, President Biden faces the major challenge of trying to ease concerns among Americans that he's too old for another term. So he has to prove on the debate stage that he's sharp, energetic, has the mental fitness for another four years. And I think his team would probably prefer he avoids gaffes and that he shows the American public that he can think on his feet because he has been praised for some speeches like the State of the Union addresses. Um, but those are scripted speeches. And this is a different kind kind of situation. Um, on Trump's side, I think their goal is basically to expand his base here. You know, he's going in with polling either neck and neck with Biden, as you mentioned, or in some cases ahead of Biden. So he faces the challenge, though, of getting more voters into his camp, maybe appealing somehow to more moderate Republicans or independents. I think his team probably prefers he avoid anger or saying anything that could be deemed offensive and instead focusing on what he would do with another chance at the White House. So many watching Biden's acuity and Trump's temperament, really. CNN will have the ability to use a mute button at tonight's debate if either candidate goes over there a lot of time or tries to interrupt. Alex, it's really in response to what was considered an unruly debate between the two in 2020. Does this new element favor one candidate more than the other? And what's the risk to CNN of using it? Yeah, we'll have to see how this plays out. But my initial thought was it could end up favoring Biden in the sense of he'd be able to speak and maintain his train of thoughts without interruptions from Trump. But the same really goes on the Trump side. He'd be able to finish his thoughts without Biden, you know, interjecting maybe a fact check or or a concern that he has with something the former president said. Um, a risk, though, on CNN side is really when it comes down to fact checking, they won't um, be able to have the other candidate. Uh, step in and correct something. So it's all on the moderators, but it will int be interesting to see how also CNN deals with the fact that we might be able to see body language. We might be able to even hear yelling or whatever else with the mics off. So um, how will that impact viewing this debate um, without having the mics on, but also just being able to see the two on stage and how they react to one another? Now, Trump has been going off on Truth Social, complaining about Fox News and Biden. He didn't really like that the conservative network had a Biden spokesperson on, and he also accused the president of being a threat to democracy, among other things. What is his strategy to these outbursts, and is it just Trump blowing off steam? Yeah, so Trump has been attacking Biden as what he says is a threat to democracy um, more increasingly lately. And I think this is him and his team's uh, attempt to kind of flip the, the switch on uh, flip the script on Biden. Um, he's trying to rebuke the central argument of Biden and his campaign, which has been that Trump's refusal to accept the 2020 election results, his role in January 6th his call to prosecute uh, political opponents, that those are all evidence that the former president's a threat to democracy. He's trying to instead claim that Biden is. You know, Trump, uh, his true social post came out because he saw that Biden's campaign uh, communications director, Michael Tyler, went on Fox this morning. But Trump's own deputy campaign director, uh, Caroline Sunshine, went on right after. So, you know, Trump, uh, occasionally will bash Fox um, over some of his guests and their commentary. And Thursday morning was also just an indication that he's tuned in. Um, he's following the news before he takes the debate stage in Atlanta. And that could part be part of him just blowing off steam ahead of this uh, debate, like you said. So a lot of elements here, but he's definitely plugged in and watching. Now, Alex, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell isn't joining President Trump and many Republicans in personally attacking President Biden ahead of this debate. Today in Louisville, though, McConnell made it clear he thinks Biden's policies are bad, but said, quote, he's a good guy. Why is McConnell striking a different chord ahead of this debate? Yeah, interestingly, Biden and McConnell actually have a pretty long history of working together in the Senate. And I do think the two have respect for one another and some sort of a personal relationship on some level. And we've seen that in McConnell has tried to show uh, that he you know, respects Biden, but he chose this fine line with, of course, being 
conservative Republican and now somebody who has endorsed uh, Trump in the race. Um, but he's made clear that he thinks that Trump has a strong case against Biden, but he doesn't have to deploy personal destruction uh, when he makes his case against the president. You know, McConnell himself um, is a pretty strong debater. So he's focused here on policy over personality and over personal attacks. Um, and I think he's he's pushing that narrative out as maybe a, a strategy strategy advice to the Trump campaign um, that you know Biden can be taken down by focusing on his handling of things like the economy, inflation, immigration, <clears throat> and not by focusing on these personal attacks. Great insight. Thank you, Alex. The Hills, Alex and Gitano. That's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Margaret Chadbourne. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.